Hello, everybody, and welcome back to the State of the League podcast, where I, Jack, a.k.a. Jokic Joe Star, am taking a look at the upcoming NBA season through the lens of the fans of different basketball teams. And today I am joined by Rob from Basketball Archives on TikTok, and we're going to be talking about the San Antonio Spurs. Rob, how are you doing? I'm, I'm doing great. I'm optimistic as a Spurs fan. Obviously, there's Wembenyama, but I feel like there's there's so much to be excited about, even outside of Wembenyama. So, overall, I'm optimistic, but but definitely, I appreciate you for having me on, my dude. Definitely appreciate you for having me on. Yeah, we are happy to have you here, absolutely. And so, the first question I have for you as a Spurs fan is, how do you feel about where the Spurs are at as a franchise? I mean, where we're at as a franchise, obviously, is such a huge turning point. I think, you know, blessed is a is is what I would say, because there's teams that they search for that new player, that new that new foundation that they can build around. Sometimes that search is a decade, two decades long, and it's been only about five, six years since we've been you know, like a realistic contender, that's not that long. So to, so to be, you know, in the spot to get the number one overall pick and acquire a player like Wembenyama, it's just, you know, we're, we're in a very fortunate situation. So I don't want to, you know, I don't want to gloss over that. So I think, uh, yeah, I'm incredibly optimistic, but it's, it's for more things than just Wembenyama. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I feel like, gaining when Vinyama it kind of it overwrites any progress you've kind of made into a rebuild as far as like press coverage goes because there yeah there was like a three-year build-up to him being in the draft and so once you get that first overall pick there's not a ton I mean I was talking about Devin Vassell but there's not a ton of like ESPN coverage of a guy like him or something like that and so there is more than one Vinyama to be optimistic about I totally agree with you there and I'm excited just because like I feel like San Antonio had a nice foundation to then fall into that number one pick where you could get a guy that everyone agrees is probably going to end up being the tier of player that can be the best player on a championship team. And so when you have uh, Keldon Johnson, Devin Vassell, Jeremy Sohan, all these pieces already in place, and you're like, okay, you're going to be our 1A, come in and be our best player and like lead us as far as you can take us. I think San Antonio was in a really good spot to end up being that. Um, oh, oh, yeah. And the fact that Wembenyama plays the position he plays, there's absolutely no resistance from a positional standpoint in San Antonio. He's going to step in and have all the agency he wants to have within the offense. There's going to be offensive sets where he plays the four and he's going to able to stretch the floor a little bit and he's going to be able to move fluidly in that way obviously we want him to play five on defense we don't want him to move out from the basket too much we want him to get those blocks uh but but at the same time you know there's there's so many opportunities for him to be successful and his impact on the offense i think it's it's going to do so many good things for the other players as well because i'm looking at you know like keldon johnson he's He's more efficient when he's in a more catch and shoot type role. We saw it whenever we had DeJounte Murray and he wasn't playing on ball as much. He was a more efficient three point shooter. And I think that we're going to see a lot of that with Wembenyama. He's going to get the ball down low. Everyone's going to crash on Wemby, kick to Keldon, catch and shoot. And I think that, you know, there's no reason why he's not shooting, you know, mid 40s from beyond the arc and, you know, being a really, you know, efficient contributing player. Yeah, I am curious about that, uh, just in terms of like his immediate gravity on <clears throat> offense, just because uh, he is still pretty skinny when Binyama, and so like the ability, I think at the start of the season, you're going to see a lot of that where he catches it in the post and three guys just swarm him, and if he can get uh, something like a little like one dribble into like a jump hook going or something like that, that gravity will kind of continue, because his release point is so ridiculous that you're going to have to like swarm the ball when he has it down low and stuff like that. But I also, it would not surprise me if there's like some growing pains offensively, just because international basketball is such a different style of play and all that. And so I don't know with the way the league 
and fans watch basketball, I would not be surprised if like the couple, the first couple weeks of the season, people are freaking out because he's like only really good on defense. And yeah, he is not like an explosive superstar offensive player right out of the gate. Yeah, no, I I agree with that wholeheartedly. There's going to be a lot of growing pains and people are going to just jump to all kinds of conclusions right away based on a handful of really inefficient games. But like, when you break it down, it's like there's really very few 19-year-olds who step into the NBA and who are efficient right out of the gate. And Wemby's not going to be an exception to that. Like he's going to he's going to struggle from beyond the arc because people are going to be Ding him up closer than he's ever felt before. People are going to be targeting him. And he's going to be the the uh the center of a lot of hard fouls. I mean, it's a good thing he's a pretty good free throw shooter cuz he's going to go to the line a lot. You know, but at the same time, you know, he's he's going to have so many welcome to the NBA moments. So, I mean, Giannis is going to bully him and Bede's going to bully him. He's going to, he's not even going to know what to do guarding Jokic the, the, the first, you know, handful of times he meets him. And so he, there's going to be a lot of growing pains, but I also think there's going to be some welcome to Wemby moments. And I've been saying this where people think they're going to have enough time to get that floater off. People think they're going to have enough time to get that set corner three, get that shot off. And Wemby's going to be one step getting a fingertip on that. And they're going to be like, oh, I thought I had time for that. But, you know, that's going to be the impact of Wembenyama's defense. But you're right. Those growing pains on offense, those are going to be real. Those are going to be real. Yeah. And I like what you said uh, about the floaters and the three pointers. I think that's where he really steps in and has an immediate impact for San Antonio because everyone's going to look at like his matchups versus Giannis Jokic and beat the league's best big man. And that's really tough for a guy his size when you like get a shoulder into somebody that thin and kind of get him off balance. Uh, the superstars in the league are going to be able to score on him. I'm not like, uh, I'm not expecting him to just come in and clamp somebody like that up. But as far as like team defense goes, it's a lot like a more mobile Rudy Gobert on the perimeter where he's able to kind of intimidate a big man into like dumping it off to a guard or whatever. And that guard, like you said, he thinks he has the floater. He's like eight, nine feet out from the basket. And it's just going to be. Yeah, a welcome to Wimbanyama moment where he just gets a fingertip on it and completely alters the way you can uh, move and score the basketball in a lot of different ways. It's very, uh, yeah, I think I'm really excited to see what he does defensively right from the get-go. Oh, yeah, absolutely. But, I mean, in that same vein, you know, he's going to struggle offensively if he thinks that he's going to take three, four, five dribbles and – and create his own shot. That's, that's, that's really not going to be there in the NBA too often. I'm not going to say he's never going to do it, but pop's going to put him in situations to take one dribble or catch it on a catch a, 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 an oop or something like that to where it's, you know, he's not having to create for himself as much as, you know, we're serving it to him on a platter. So yeah. yeah, no, I, I agree with that. It's just uh, in the NBA, um, it, it's hard to be a big guy and have a handle like that and use it constantly. And that's like, that's the big flashy thing is that he is like seven foot five and moves like a guard. But I think that movement is a lot better suited to being off the ball a lot of the times. Um, and just like, when you're seven foot five and dribbling the basketball in the NBA, there's so many guys who just like get a hand in there and they're off to the races in the fast break. And that's a really demoralizing kind of turnover is when you just have one guy who dribbles three or four times and turns it over because he's huge. And I don't think I'm not worried about when Benyama being that kind of player, especially with like how he's come across in interviews and how grateful he seemed to be drafted to a place with so much structure and such a, like established coach as Popovich in San Antonio, I think he's going to be willing to do whatever it takes for the team to be competitive on the offensive end. I'm, I haven't been worried about that since day one. And so I don't know, there's just a ton of question marks around him. And uh, I don't know. I don't want this whole first, uh, like, what do you think about the Spurs to just turn into, what do you think about one Binyama? But it is obviously the first thing you have to talk about and in terms of the state of the franchise. So I would challenge you 
everything else going on that you said is promising with the Spurs besides Wembenyama. What do you feel about that? I feel I feel really really strong. Like I was saying earlier about uh, Keldon Johnson being in his more natural role, playing more off the ball, having slightly less agency within the offense. I think those the amount of responsibilities would be really good for him. Um, I also think uh, you know Devin Vassell was banged up a lot last year. I think him being healthy, moving into moving into a, a more natural three and D style role for him. I think he was maybe having to do a little bit too much on offense last year. So I think he kind of falls into his natural role a little bit more with the offensive guy and it, well, basically offensive and defensive presence of women Um, But also more importantly than that, like when I see a guy like Jeremy Sohan and how he improved mid season, not only the free throw shooting, but just his, his pass first mindset. Like I love, I love, love, love his game so much. So I think, when I, I want to see what an off season looks like after he had his rookie season under his belt and, you know, sleeper guys like, like Julian Champagne, like I'm, I'm talking Julian Champagne right now. Like the last five games of the regular season, dude was dropped a 20 piece and over six rebounds, like 45% from three. And we just signed him to a four year, $12 million deal. And, we really only do that whenever we we think a guy is going to be a spark off the bench. Pop really doesn't throw around these four four year deals very lightly, and so I think that he's a guy we can definitely be excited about. Um, you know, but not everything's positive. You know, like I'm not really understanding why we brought in like you know a guy like Reggie Bullock. You know, I don't. You know, I, I I don't I don't know what he's gonna bring to the table. I think he's a good I think he's a cool guy off the court, but I just don't know what he's gonna bring that like, you know, Doug McDermott doesn't already have on our team. You know, it's like I, uh, but you know, overall, I think that there's a lot of guys who are 24 years and younger who are really able to gel together if we can keep them together under Pop. Yeah, that that was my second bullet on the state of the Spurs is just kind of a. Uh... It's time when Benyama getting a guy like that kind of spells the beginning of the end as far as like a rebuild goes. You do want to start looking to not being like as competitive as possible right now and selling the farm just to get a guy who can help you win like a playoff series. But in terms of like you're sifting through the roster and being like, okay, this guy is a part of our long term plans and this guy probably isn't. And I think San Antonio is in a good spot with all of those guys who are 24 and younger to start doing that, to throw around 10, 15 minutes a game with like weird lineups being experimental and kind of seeing like what you want to do with all of this youth moving forward. Cause I think one of the things that a lesser franchise might struggle with is having so much youth that you just kind of get caught not knowing who to play and not knowing who really deserves minutes. I'm not worried about that with San Antonio as much, but I am looking forward to seeing them make some decisions personnel wise. Absolutely. Yeah. That that's a really great point. Some franchises don't really know how to deal with developing multiple young players at the same time. Like a franchise that's currently doing it right now, like OKC, I'm really interested to see how, you know, how do you, continue to develop SGA as this, you know, all NBA guard while developing Giddy and Chet and Jalen Williams, you know, there's so many guys that are developing on that team, but you know, that's, that's a completely different story, you know? Yeah, absolutely. And yeah, I think uh, OKC is kind of a good look at what San Antonio could aim to be in a couple years, just in terms of like, uh, having one of the best players on the planet, but continuing to develop younger guys around him. And so, all right, the second question I have for you moving on from the state of where they are is how do you feel about what the Spurs did in this previous off season? It's not the most active off season in the world when Binyama is still really the headline for this category, but there was some other stuff done in terms of like Reggie Bullock and what you said. So I'm just curious how you felt about whatever moves they made. Yeah. Yeah. We, yeah, we didn't, you know, we're not historically uh, a very flashy off season team. So, you know, we, we kept it pretty low key per usual, but you know, we brought in Bullock, we brought in um, 
campaign, um, e- even though I, I wasn't. Yeah, I wasn't thrilled to see like a, a video he posted saying he didn't really want to be in San Antonio. So it was like, <laughs> so I was like, okay, I don't know how to, I don't know how to take that. So, um, so I guess I'm kind of mid excited, but like, you know, we re-signed Trey Jones. We sh- we re-shirt up our our young point guard, and you know, we're we're trying to develop him. Another young guy that we're developing. So. I like that move. We we gave Champagne that contract. So I think it's more about just where we kept the young core together rather than brought in a bunch of guys. Uh we brought in uh Osman as well. I, I, I didn't I didn't dislike that. I think we need some some good wing depth, but uh yeah, I yeah, I just I wasn't in love with the Bullock deal. I, I was like, all right, you know that's what we're getting out of this grant williams trade it's like all right it it is what it is though yeah um i think they didn't really need to bring in a ton of veterans as far as like structure in the locker room goes san antonio is never really going to struggle with that just because they have so many guys from like previous uh, iterations of the team that still kind of hang around and do a lot of player development and stuff like that. But I don't know. I'm I'm a fan of CD Osman. I think he's all right. Uh, I think he's already 27, which surprised me, but between him and if you can get campaign to buy in, then uh, that's a fair amount of playoff experience just between the three guys that you talked about. I think it's a nice amount of experience around the league to surround a locker room full of young guys with, but it's also not like none of those guys really jump out to me as like traditional good locker room vets that you want to like pick up. Uh, I think campaign seems a lot younger than he is as far as like maturity goes a lot of the time, but uh, maybe San Antonio is a good spot to help him with that as well. Uh, I think, I don't know. Being a guy who was just in like the conference finals, the conference semifinals in Phoenix and all that, I think it's a it's a nice guy to add to the locker room for San Antonio. It's not going to revolutionize your franchise or anything like that, but it, you know you'll take what you can get, especially in a small market like we talked about earlier. You're not just going to be able to like get whoever you want at the end of free agency or anything like that because you live in Los Angeles now or something like that. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. Yeah. All the big names don't want to be in San Antonio, but you're absolutely right. Just adding people that have, you know, essentially been there, done that, been to Eastern Conference Finals, been to, you know, finals, you know, played those high intense games before, you know, those are the guys you want, you know, talking to the guys that are 19, 20 years old in the locker room, you know, teaching them how to prepare for those big games. So, yeah. And, and, and I think, you know, for a lot of franchises, those players are more important. But I always just view like even if we don't have the veteran leadership on the court, we have the veteran leadership on the court side. We have the the most seasoned NBA coach, and and you know, even if we have incredibly young guys, we have you know, it, you know, Popovich to kind of level them out whenever need be. Yeah, and uh. I don't know. It rocks. It makes me happy now because uh, a couple years ago, I was like, dude, Popovich just doesn't seem like he's having as much fun coaching, which like fun in like the Bill Belichick sense where you look over and he's just like really grumpy. But I don't know. There's uh, a lot more sense of purpose with what he's there to do now. And I, I that makes me happy because if if he retires, fine. But like if he retires after the Spurs win, 17 games and like it was just like a locker room full of kids that he was babysitting i don't want pop to go out like that so i'm happy i'm happy shit's moving in a different direction now i suppose oh yeah he's gonna be able to send a properly built ship off in the right direction you know and then you know at that point you just gotta hope that you know what you did is gonna stand the test of time and you know it's like no one can guarantee that but you know, if anyone can build that foundation for the future, I, you know, in San Antonio, we say in pop, we trust. <laughs> well, it's trusting a guy like that, definitely. All right. The third question I have for you are the, what are the expectations around the San Antonio Spurs next season? I want to know what, like, a regular, reasonable expectation you feel like is. What would a surprisingly nice season look like? And what would a disappointing season look like? 
Um, well, I think uh, a realistic season. I think with everything that we've talked about earlier, improvements with all of our young guys, adding Wembenyama, like I don't see how we don't improve by around 15 wins. You know, we, we won 22 games last season. If we finished 37 and 45, it wouldn't surprise me a lot. I'm not going to be some crazy delusional Spurs fan and be like, oh, dude, we're a for sure playoff lock. You know, we're going to be like finished fourth or fifth in the West. I'm like, dude, no, there's going to be growing pains. If a couple of people go down in our lineup, then we are going to be struggling. And so, you know, I do think we're going to win a significant amount more than we did last year. But, you know, I, I, I think, you know, we finish 11th in the West. That that probably makes sense to me. You know, just missing the play in something like that. You know, I could I could see 11th, 12th in the West. But, you know, it would be really disappointing if, you know, if, if we had a couple of guys go down and, and it really – you know, sets it's you know sets back uh, a lot of what we've been building, and so I think that you know really the only thing that could hold us back would be would be injuries because these young guys they just need time on the court. You know, only thing that would stop that would just be you know them wearing a boot or something. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, definitely. Those are pretty on par with what I felt like. Uh, this when you have a team like this where uh, I don't know. As far as like expectations of winning immediately, you're not really expecting all that much. All a disappointing season looks like is wasted time in terms of not developing guys. And yeah, that's what I said is like a record similar to last year, even if you won eight more games. But the vibes around the franchise for that, like, fuck, we like Wemby missed a ton of time. All the guys were trying to get touches. We're not really able to be on the court at the same time. We could not do a lot in terms of progressing what this team looks like for the future. I think that's clearly a disappointing season. And then a reasonably a reasonable expectation. I think I had here. Yeah, I had in the thick of the play in hunt. And so if they missed it would not surprise me, but I think for, uh, I don't know the duration of the middle of the season, it would not surprise me either. If we were looking at San Antonio and we're like, Whoa, they're like really fighting for that nine or eight seed or whatever. And then if something goes wrong down the stretch, when you really need like a composed experienced team to start winning a lot of basketball games at important moments in the season, yeah, San Antonio might come up short in that regard, but I think for a lot of the season, if they're like fighting with teams like uh, like the Houston Rockets or something like that, which I don't have huge expectations for as far as like playoff success, if they're in the thick of it with teams like that, then I think, yeah, that's reasonable to expect. And then surprising, I think, I don't know, to the top of the play-in tournament, probably not locking in a playoff team, but if they could get... Uh, home court in the playing tournament, that would be, I'd be like, wow, good for San Antonio. They really <laughs> overachieved this season. Dude, honestly, you're more optimistic than I am. I, I like, I, I don't see how we even make the play in. I, I think that we're, you know, because even last year, the Mavs, uh, the Mavs didn't make the play in and they won like 40 games. Yeah. And so, like, it's like, I, there, I, there's no way we win 40 games. There's no way we almost go 500 next year. So like, I'm, I'm kind of looking at it through that lens and I'm like, you know, 35, 36 wins would be, would be, you know, a good improvement from last season, but you know, that's still not making the play in, but I, I, I appreciate the optimism. I like it. <laughs> oh yeah. Well, I'm big. I think Wemby's going to be impactful defensively and I'm a big Keldon Johnson guy as we'll get into in a little bit. I like, I, I think he's posed for a little bit of a breakout, but I'll hold off on that for right now. Um, well, I guess we could just move on. Like Expected moves towards the trade deadline next season. What do you think San Antonio needs? Like, What do you expect them to do, and what would you want them to do Like, if you were in charge of the team? Well, I mean, like we were saying earlier, San Antonio, we, we don't make a lot of big splashes. We're, we're not uh, – we, we, we historically aren't dishing out massive contracts to people mid season. Um, so I, I don't think we will make any moves if not maybe just one or two small role player type moves, maybe, you know, a, a eight, $10 million contract here or there, but 
at the end of the day, if I was the GM in charge of the franchise, I'm, I'm trying to target the dynamic sort of shifty guard that can, I can pair alongside of Wembenyama. I, I I'm going after uh, like on my dream list, I would have Halliburton or Garland or, you know, I mean, I would, I would take a lot of guys that I would want to pair next to him, but you know, it's, you know, Tyrese Maxey would be a really good option as well. Like, so many, so many amazing, you know, young guards that I feel like would be able to sort of blossom and come, uh, come into their own alongside of Wembenyama. So I think, uh, you know, I would be eyeing somebody like that. Not saying that Trey Jones isn't developing into the guy that we can rely on, but I just think that, you know, if I'm trying to to develop Wembenyama alongside of a dynamic point guard, um, I'm trying to target that guy now. I'm trying to identify who that is and trying to see how I can get them in San Antonio. <laughs> yeah. And with the, with the surveys I sent out on Reddit, that was kind of a, uh, the vibe as well is that everybody likes Trey Jones. And I mean, whatever he put up like 13 and six, 13 and seven for a 23 year old, that's not bad at all. Uh, but in terms of like just a high level point guard, uh, which you would want with a center like when Binyama, I think that is kind of what people would like to see move to San Antonio. Uh, And in terms of like the roster, do you think, I'm curious about this. When I looked at it, I look at uh, Doug McDermott, 31 years old and a 41% three point shooter. That feels like uh, an asset that a competitive team would give up something a little bit valuable to, uh, get onto their roster if they were in like a tight spot do you think he makes it past the trade deadline do you think he like does san antonio just straight up love him and would it need to be like i don't know something a bit of an overpay to get him off the roster um i I don't know i mean he's making about 10 million dollars a year right now so i i think that san antonio kind of likes what he brings to the table for the amount that we're paying him we we view him as like a pretty like team friendly contract for what he brings to the table but at the same time you're right there's a lot of guys who are like man we could use a a sharpshooter off the bench to be our you know seventh eighth guy come in provide some good depth for a, a playoff run and so i i think you know he's not really a part of our long term future so i honestly don't yeah, I, I kind of agree. I think someone could poach him. You know, I, I don't think that he stays in San Antonio long term. Definitely not. Yeah, because that uh, <clears throat> that contract that rocks for a guy who can shoot that well. And I mean, obviously, uh, he's not like a defensive stalwart or anything like that. But uh, yeah, a competitive team could use him. And so I don't know when you're projecting this far out, like what teams are going to do or want or need at the trade deadline. It's pretty much all conjecture it's just kind of I, I was just trying to get like a vibe before you feel like the roster is at and everything and well, yeah well we like him in san antonio and 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 pop definitely sees his value because there's a his, history of guys that their job is to like hustle and shoot threes within our lineup and if, <laughs> if, if, if that's that's literally it if you are giving your all and you're a consistent three-point shooter then then you can be a matt bonner on our team we will <laughs> we will have you <laughs> absolutely hell yeah the man bonner drop that fucking rocks oh yeah mr new balance no kidding uh i was just i did a dumb video about him the other day he had a sandwich blog a while back where he would uh go around the, like in nba cities he would try out their sandwiches and he would give them a rating and shit like that and it's pretty interesting i don't know i like it when uh niche role players just do silly stuff like that off the court too many people are like low-key you could you could be a celebrity if you're just like a little silly in the NBA. Oh yeah, yeah. Have some fun with it. Absolutely. Beyond that, I don't really expect. Like you said, San Antonio is not uh, the most active team in the world, and I feel like as far as like assets go, there's a uh, not a ton. I don't think they're in a great position to like take on bad contracts the way somebody like Washington is because you're going to want to start paying your players who are they're in like that 23 range with a lot of their good players. And so you want to start extending rookie contracts or getting them onto new deals at some point and stuff like that. And so, yeah, I don't know. I don't expect them to be super active, but like I said, I just wanted to check what the vibes were. So my fifth 
question for you is what does the player prog- like which player are you looking forward to watching progress the most next season with a team like San Antonio with so many young players this is the most extensive like bullet points list I have in my notes just because there's so many guys who could take step forwards into interesting directions next year what are your thoughts on that I think I'm I'm leaning towards Devin Vassell taking that that next big jump. I mean, I think you know it, it could be Keldon, it, it could be Trey Jones, but I think it, it's it's going to be Devin Vassell. I think the I think so many of the times we look at really good defensive perimeter guards, and the reason why they're able to be so effective perimeter defenders is because there's a stable rim protector right behind them. They're able to be aggressive and, and really dig into that offensive player because they have that. And he really hasn't had that for his entirety of time in San Antonio. And I think that Devin Vassell is is definitely, well, now he's our second best defender, but um, but he's you know, he's going to be um a menace with with Wemby right behind him. So like I I think that not only offensively he he's going to remain consistent and you know he he hits so many difficult shots i would love to see him take some smarter shots <laughs> so he doesn't have to hit the the fadeaway mid-range jump shots over people's you know contested hands so you know i think he's you know he's going to learn those things he's going to take more efficient shots but yeah he's going to have the freedom to be the aggressive defender that we know he can be so i think uh I'm going to I'm looking forward to see his progression next season the most out of anybody's uh I mean outside of Wemby kind of but we've we've talked Wemby a lot. Yeah, I think it's unfair. Like you almost have to be like okay, number 1 is Wembenyama cuz everybody's staring at him, but beyond that there are these guys who you saw do these big flashes last last season, like Vassell, who only played about half the year before his knee was kind of messed up. I hope I'm curious if he sustains it's like damn near 40% on like seven threes a game while being that capable of a defender and wild, like you said, really being able to dig into that role with a guy like when Vinyama behind him. I think he's gonna surprise a lot of people next season just in terms of like the overall impact on Winning and just when you throw on a Spurs game or any game in general, when you see a guard just going at it like that, uh, kind of how um, Davion Mitchell does in Sacramento oh. or something like that, it jumps out at you even from like a casual standpoint. And so I think uh, people throw on the game to see one Vinyama and Devin himself might be a name that kind of sticks out in some big high intensity hustle plays next year. Absolutely. Well, I mean, historically, you think about defense in the NBA, and it's all just big guys. It's all just block getters. But then, you know, you see those, you know, those Marcus Smart guys that, wow, it's like those like Tony Allen type dudes where it's like, wow, those guys are just those guys are digging in. Those guys are uh, just making it so tough on those guards out there. And I think Devin Vassell, while he's not there yet, I think that he's he's got that those capabilities. So I'm hoping Wembenyama, that that defensive duo, kind of gives him that freedom. Absolutely. Uh, another one I have, I, I just wrote down Keldon Johnson, twenty five or twenty four five and five incoming. Uh, how do you feel about that prediction? I I mean I love it. I mean I I think that the likelihood of him scoring that is is maybe uh, I, I I don't know I. I at the end of the day, I don't want to say it's too far fetched, but I think that if anything, his scoring is going to take a, a bit of a hit just just because of how much we're going to try to give Wembenyama agency within the offense. I'm not saying that he's going to command so much of the ball that Keldon and Devin aren't going to be able to score, but I think more often than not, we're going to try to get Wemby involved first and foremost, and then it's going to be about how we can incorporate everyone else. So I think, you know, if I was to see him score like 17, 18 points a game, but his rebounding goes up, his assists go up and his overall efficiency goes up. I think that would make sense. But I think, you know, we're going to, we're going to sort of baby Wimbanyama, allow him to make mistakes, give him opportunities. And, you know, that, that may not lead to Keldon having huge counting numbers, but I like the optimism yet again. I love it. 
Yeah, I mean, I'm. It's it's very easy <laughs> to be high on a team that you are not uh, the most tapped into, or that you don't like actively root for, because there's two kinds of fans in the NBA. It feels like where somebody is either completely biased, like you said, where they're like the Spurs are locking in a playoff seed, or they're the alternate where they don't want to even like hope for anything. And so it's just like, you know, uh, like whatever happens is fine, but I'm not like hoping for anything the bare minimum a lot of the time. And I think the Spurs and Kellen Johnson, they probably realistically exist somewhere in between that next season. I think his efficiency going up would be super cool. And I would love to see him. I think he's only like 28% three point shooter, which if you're building around a big man, you want your like combo guards forward to be able to be at least average from beyond the arc. And he's young. So I'm not, his mechanics look fine on his jumper. I'm not terrified of it being like, a huge problem moving forward, but it would be cool to see it go in a little bit more next season. And yeah, maybe I'm a little bit high with 24, but I like the guy and it's always, I don't know. Every time I threw on a Spurs game last season, it felt like he was going for a little bit more than what I thought he averaged. And so I don't know, maybe I'm oh, yeah. Well, no, I, I, I think, uh, I think you're, you're spot on. I mean, he's, he's a, he's a fun guy to watch. He's got a high motor, and honestly, I like the dude off the court too. Like he's he's a he's a funny guy, and you know I like I I liked him ever since I I remember that that video of him when they went out to a nice dinner and he just grabbed the steak off the plate with his hand and just took a big bite out of it, and he was like, "This is how I always eat steak." And I was like, "I like this guy." I was like, "I, I he's got that dog in him." I like that. <laughs> Absolutely, I'm dead. that's funny. <laughs> Yeah. Um, the, another player I have is Jeremy Sohan. I mean, we're just kind of like running through the big names on the Spurs roster at this point, but I like to me, Sohan is a player that, uh, an off season in terms of like growing his basketball IQ is he's a player that could really benefit from that in terms of how you said, uh, being a pass first guy offensively, when you have an off season to learn what the right reads look like and make them a lot quicker. And then when you have an off season to understand what good defense looks like in the NBA more and more in terms of like aiding your team and being like a glue guy, a connector guy defensively, I think Sohan, has a lot uh, of potential in those areas. He obviously gets the Rodman comps because of his hair, but he is a, yeah, he's a high motor guy. And I think he's the kind of player that uh, settling into what the NBA looks like can really help him grow. Absolutely. I, I could not agree more. I think, you know, those the Rodman comps are a little bit early, a little bit too soon. It's like, you know, we, we can't go compare him to one of the best defenders all time this early in his career, even though I, I understand where it's coming from. But at, at the same time, you know, I, you know, just going back to the free throw thing, when it whenever I see a 19 year old willing to change anything about his game, it could be free throws, it could be something else, just willing to change something about their game, a facet of their game that maybe they've had their entire life mid season. That that is so incredibly important, and and just a, it's just a, such a positive look at like how he's going to develop as as a player. So I think, you know, like you were saying, the his pass first mindset, getting used to the NBA, those kind of reads, you know, one year under his belt is 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 going to be a, a great foundation for the future. But it's also something that he's been doing a long time. Like I remember watching him back at Baylor. This dude was this dude was dishing the rock and was looking to pass people open. So like, this is a part of who he is. So like, I think, you know, he's sharpening his skills and I think, you know, he's going to be a, a really great defensive presence, you know, and when we got guys like Devin Vassell and Wembenyama, it's going to let him even be more aggressive. Like, like we were talking about earlier, it's just, you know, you got better defenders around you. You can, you know, you can go after your guy a little bit more. Yeah, absolutely. And I love that you touched on the free throw thing because that's such a – it's not just a unique story. It's also so telling because it's – they're kind of asking him to do something a little embarrassing uh, as far as like it obviously makes you stick out when you shoot free throws with one hand the way he does. But for a guy that young to like 
be like, that's fine because it helps me be more impactful and therefore helps the team be more effective, helps us win, moves us forward. I think that is very telling about where his mindset is. And you love to see that out of a guy who you're expecting to be any like forward who can pass and play defense these days gets the Draymond comparisons too. And I think that's unfair because Draymond is also so good, but, uh, when you are expecting a guy to be a connective piece the way San Antonio wants Sohan to be, the fact that he's immediately willing to sacrifice or like stick out for the benefit of the team, I think that's really good. Oh, yeah. I mean, Coach Pop says it all the time. He's like, I don't want players that have egos. And if you're worried about how you look and your style of free throw shooting, then you're you kind of have a little bit of an ego about you. And, and you know, that's not going to fly in Coach Pop's locker room. So I think that, you know, he realized early on, he's like, I got to make this change. And, you know, he's in an environment where, like, you know, he's not going to get clowned for that change. You know, he's he's not going to they're not going to shame him for shooting that free throw that way. They they want to be efficient as humanly possible. Absolutely. And it was crazy effective, too. I, I did a yeah, it was a video of him and uh, Mason Plumley went right to left handed for his free throws. Both of them took like 20, 25 percent jumps in efficiency from the line, which is huge. It's huge just straight up. But when you go from being like completely ineffective at the line to now being a guy that you really don't want to foul, it helps you stay on the court so much in, in general. And then in terms of like crunch time situations as well. Oh yeah. I mean, if you're a guy that plays 30 minutes, that, that could be the difference in five, six points a game. And you know, two possessions decide so many games. And it, you know, if you give yourself that opportunity, then yeah, like you said, you just, you're on the court a lot more than not. Absolutely. Um, is there any other players on the roster that jump out to you besides those three and then when Benyama? Well, I mean, we I mentioned earlier, like Julian Champagne, like just a little bit, like just towards the end of the season and when guys were uh, last year, when guys were banged up and, and we really were just kind of throwing darts at the dartboard and seeing what would stick. Um, Julian Champagne stuck. <laughs> and we, we, we clearly saw that this is a guy that has a high motor. He doesn't mind attacking people that a big guy down low doesn't matter who it is. He's trying to dunk on him and stare him down. And he's got that kind of that, that energy and he can accompany that with good, efficient shooting from mid range and, and, and beyond the arc. So I think, you know, th this is a guy that I think I'm excited for his development as much as I am Trey Jones and, and Sohan. So I think, um, not saying he's going to end up being our Manu Ginobili coming off the bench. Um, I am wearing the Manu shirt right now. That's sick. Um, but um, but um, I'm not saying he's about to be Manu Ginobili, but, you know, every single team needs those sparks off the bench in order to just give that first unit some relief. And I think that he's going to be a, a big, important factor in that. Absolutely. Uh, yeah. Uh, watching that run last year, uh, I don't know. That is like a defining difference between a small market and a big market to me is he was playing well enough to get like, I remember him getting clips on ESPN and whatever and kind of blowing up on social media. But if he was in, I hate to keep bringing up Los Angeles because it, it makes me feel like such a hater, but uh, the way like Max Christie gets a ton of hype in LA, I feel like he could easily be a similar player just in terms of uh, goes on a nice little run and then immediately gets like a huge amount of fans behind him. And in San Antonio, the fans are super passionate. So that probably makes up for it a little bit in terms of like quality over quantity or what have you. But yeah, I am really excited to see what he does off the bench uh, in a more expanded role and like you said, having a quality bench to give the first unit relief is so big, especially for a guy like Wen Binyama, who I hate to keep coming back to him, but in terms of like he might be out of shape, he might like be coming off of an injury where he can only play limited minutes, he might get into foul trouble, something like that. So when you have to like go into the bag a little bit, it's nice to have a bunch of different options in terms of like the way you can play uh, your team off the bench and stuff like that. So yeah, shout out to, is it Champagne or Champagne? I, I couldn't it, tell. It's, it's Champagne. All right. 
perfect. Yeah, I yeah. I, I think uh, he also has a brother, Justin Champagne. I don't. I, I, I think he just got signed with the Celtics. I, I need to confirm that though. But they're both balling. Hell yeah, absolutely. Well, that that makes me happy. You love to see guys uh, succeed when given the opportunity and stuff like that. So I hope I hope it keeps happening for San Antonio. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, there's yeah a whole bunch of young guys. Yeah, we just we need some time to gel. That's about it. Yeah, father, that father is, time that will is. tell. <laughs> yes, it will. All right, uh, that's all the questions I had for you today. Um, is there anything you want to plug while you have the platform here? Um, just you know, B Ball Archives is my page. Um, I, I do my own podcast, Baseline Bums Podcast, and chat about you know Spurs stuff and and whatnot. It's been kind of on and off during the off season, but you know, next couple of months, you know things will be starting right back up. So we'll have a lot of stuff to talk about, but yeah, that, that's, that's about it out here in Austin, Texas, shooting movies and stuff like that. So that's, that's where I am. I All appreciate right. you. Yeah. Thanks for coming on. It was a wonderful episode and uh, everybody who's listening or watching, thank you for tuning in. I will see you in the next one. Peace. Later.